our Benavia Educational Workshop event today. Uh, we are planning for the future and we'll be aging in place successfully when this is all done. Um, I am your host, Jay Lickis. I'm the marketing coordinator with Benavia. I've been there four years and I'm sure most of you all know about Benavia and you get our uh, newsletters and been to past workshops as well. So um, if you need any information, give me a shout or just check us out at benavia.org. Um, today, we are blessed with uh, one of our fine CARES partners and our expert presenter today is Denisa Barber with Arizona Senior Options. Normally, I give a little introduction, but Denisa has a wonderful PowerPoint presentation coming up that we will follow. So she has a slide with her background, which I always recommend because we're all friends here. We all got to get to know each other. So uh, before we start, a few housekeeping tips about navigating Zoom if you haven't been on there. So depending on what platform you're on, whether you're on a PC or on your phone or on an iPad, things may be a little different, but I'm going to go over the general uh, workings of Zoom. Um, one of the things I like to do is I got everybody pretty much muted right now, the audio, but um, that way we can hear the speaker. It's nice and clear, and uh, there's not a lot of background noise interfering because we want everybody to hear what's going on and have a fair chance at listening. So um, if you look in your lower left of your screen, there'll be a little microphone. You can click on that to uh, turn your microphone off and on, mute and unmute. Or in the upper right hand of your picture, there's actually a, a bar which will say unmute. If you want to hit that, it does the same thing. Um, as for your video, if anybody here wants to show their video and they haven't done it yet, in the lower left hand corner, there's also a little video camera button which you can click on which will show your video. Uh, if you have questions, I know Denise and I talked about this a little bit. We will stop periodically during the presentation so you can catch up. We have a lot of information, but if you have questions, you can raise your hand and I'll be looking for you, or you can put your question in the chat box. Or if you look at the bottom of your screen as well, there's a reactions button to the right side. It's a little smiley face with a uh, plus sign embedded in its head. And you can just go and raise your hand like that. There's a little, that's supposed to be a clap, but we use it as the raised hand. So um, mm. any of those three ways works, whatever is easiest for you. And if you go in the upper right hand corner of your screen, I'm sure you're pretty much all on gallery view right now. There's a button that says view with a square box. If you click on that, you can either click on gallery view or speaker view. The speaker view will highlight whoever's talking at the time. So if you're on speaker view right now, all you see is my big old melon of a head right now. I look like a talking head. But if you're in gallery view, you can see everybody that's at the meeting right now. And the person who's talking, their screen will be surrounded by a bright yellow border. So that makes it very simple to what's going on. So if there's no other questions, um, I'll give the floor to Denisa and welcome her from Arizona Senior Options. And we're gonna start planning for the future. What do you think, Denisa? Sounds good. Excellent. Do you want me to put the presentation up or? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Should be coming up here quickly. Let's see. It went one too far, didn't it? There we go. All right. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you for being here. My name is Denisa. I'm a registered nurse and a patient advocate with Arizona Senior Options. Um, I want to start off by um, kind of giving you an, an overview as to what made me come to this topic. So as I began contemplating about the topics that I wanted to explain and expand on today, I honestly felt overwhelmed. Uh, where was I to start? as healthcare is very complex. Um, I felt overwhelmed uh, with the extent of content that I want and feel the need to educate about. I want to share my personal as well as my professional insight and knowledge with all of you, as I want to ensure that I do not leave out crucial pieces to the puzzle, as I say. Details that make up the big picture. 
There is a movement as of late talking about aging in the right place. Um, this expression of aging in the right place as opposed to aging in place is very multifaceted um, as it's shaped by personal vision, values, principles, opportunity, circumstances, and what moves you as an individual. Now, I want to take a moment to elaborate on this as this will set the stage for the entire seminar. It's always too soon until it's too late. Ponder about that for a second, and we will revisit this um, throughout the seminar. Are you counting on being Peter Pan, living in a Peter Pan house? J.M. Barry's fantastical Peter Pan character is a boy who never grows up. Peter Pan does not worry about climbing stairs or moving about his home as he ages. He just wrestles with crocodiles and Captain Hook as his youth is his work. A professor of gerontology policy and planning at University of um, Southern California coined the term Peter Pan homes um, for homes that have stairs, lots of stairs, narrow doors, inaccessible bathrooms, and in in inadequate lighting. And of course, many of them lack many of the safety features that would help people avoid falls. That describes many of the homes that we are all growing older in. Uh, alas, we're all Wendy's, um, exiled from Neverland to the real world where age eventually catches us. That doesn't mean that we all accept being Wendy, but many of us act as if the future will be just like our past. We pretend we're Peter Pan. We think we can stay in our family home forever because it's safe and familiar. Perhaps we've even planned our retirement in a warm climate or a warmer climate state such as Arizona, having been a snowbird for a few years from the East Coast or Midwest, and now being a full-time Arizona resident. It's been estimated that about 70% of baby boomers will be aging in the suburbs and in rural areas. Uh, these are not the right place, but they are the places where living and aging in place will occur well into old age. However, what works at 50 doesn't, doesn't necessarily make sense at 70 or 80. So aging in place is not, in fact, an inaccurate description necessarily. It is a reality. Given this fact, there will be some who will be, will be able to find the right place, but some will not for a multitude of different reasons, whether being resistant to change and not moving from home, resistant to acknowledging and accepting help, or not being involved in the decision-making process. This presents several issues for all of those involved. Um, for individuals working in the healthcare and specifically the geriatric healthcare industry, the opportunities are limitless as they have embarked on missions to employ technology and find creative ways to bring goods and services um, to those aging in place, be it a medical emergency pendant, such as the life alert pendants or a medication dispersing uh, machine. For adult children, however, the challenges will be daunting at times, having to juggle work, children and aging parents and caregiving, which what we, we refer to this as the sandwich generation. And for older adults themselves, this will present a mixed blessing. Being home has its upsides, the comfort of being home in a familiar place, etc. But it also has its downside as well. For example, isolation, loneliness, which can lead to depression, falls, and a domino effect of other physical, emotional, and mental illnesses and concerns. And as I often say, aging in place works until it doesn't. Again, what works at 50 doesn't make sense at 70 or 80. Beware of the trap of the Peter Pan house, the house that assumes you never get older. Um, if you wanna to move to the next slide, Jay, perfect. A little background on me. Um, I am an ASU alumnus. Um, I'm a bachelor's of science in nursing and public and global health major. Uh, I'm, a uh, I'm a registered nurse and I've been in this industry for 10 plus years now. So I started off um, as a caregiver, well, technically as a volunteer uh, in uh, residential assisted living homes. And I worked my way up to doing um, caregiving hands-on and providing uh, much needed assistance with activities of daily living to those um, within the home environment. Uh, from that point forward, um, I expanded and, and went into assisted living management alongside my mother. We owned and operated three homes at the time. And uh, as you can imagine, I had a lot of experience hands-on with the aging process altogether. Um, everything from 
um, diabetes to heart disease, um, pulmonary concerns, end of life hospice, cancer, dementia, Parkinson's, uh, the list goes on. Uh, I do have some certifications. Uh, my specialty really is dementia. Um, it stands very near and dear to my heart um, as it is a very gruesome, um, uh, unforgiving disease. It's a progressive disease. And unfortunately, um, it does not have a cure as of yet. But um, to some extent, we are able to participate proactively in, um, in making those strides to lead a better life um, and to not wait until the last, last second to make a decision or have that decision made for us. So that's little, a little bit about me. Uh, if you want to go on to the next slide. All right. Um, some sobering statistics, right? So when I provide in-person house calls and consults, um, I, come up, um, I come face to face with what matters most to people, um, given that I'm in the comfort of their home. Uh, these are not the same as consulting with families and their loved ones in an office setting. I see a clear picture of the environment they are living in. And I often unfortunately see a mountain of bills, unwashed dishes, expired food, frozen meals with high sodium and saturated fat content, rotten vegetables, little or no, no trace of fruits, and a cluttered living space with no clear or safe walking path. And of course, the list goes on, which leads me into this slide. Um, hope is not a plan. That's something that I always uh, find myself saying to those that I serve. Um, and as you can see, uh, in 2030, one in five people, 20%, uh, which is about 20% of the US population will be over the age of 65. Um, and this number is projected to be 83.7 million, almost double its estimated population of 43 million in 2012. Uh, the baby boomers are largely responsible for this increase in the older population as they began turning 65 in 2011. Um, and um, by 2050, the surviving baby boomers will be over the age of 85. We all know this uh, next st statistic, 10,000 baby boomers will, will turn 65 every day between now and 2030, when according to the United States Census Bureau, seniors are expected to make up over 20% of the population again. And to put things in better perspective for you, in 2030, one in five people will be over 65 years old. So you may ask yourselves, how will this influx of seniors impact the future of senior living? Um, another frightening statistic pertains to falls, as they are the leading cause of death from injury among individuals over the age of 65. And one in four seniors who fracture a hip from a fall will die within six months of that injury. Um, every 20 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall in the United States, and many more are injured. And by 2030, as the graph relays, there will be seven fall-related deaths every hour. Try to grasp that number. That is frightening. Um, and the most profound effect of falling is the loss of functioning associated with independent living. Um, and of course, the last statistic I have uh, before we dive in deeper into the presentation is uh, another sobering statistic um, that I have included, and it pertains to caregivers. 64% um, of individuals over the age of 55 engage in elder care on a given day. These caregivers can spend anywhere from 20 to 45 hours per week, depending on whether the caregiver lives in the same house as their loved one, be it a spouse or a parent, um, or if the caregiver is an adult child caring for an aging parent or parents, why not? And feel free to interrupt me as I go along. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to raise your hand or write the question in the chat box as we move along. Okay. The COVID era, who would have thought, right? We are living longer and uh, of course we need to be proactive simultaneously. Of course, remarkable gains in life expectancy and declines in fertility, uh, as well as the progression of relatively large sized cohorts to the older ages have led to an aging population globally. Uh, life expectancy has increased to approximately 75 years um, of age for males and 80 years for, for females, while the total fertil fertility rate has dropped from 5% to 2.5 in the past seven decades. And for the first time, 
individuals age um, 60 or more have outnumbered children under, under the age of five. So this leads us to extended lives and extended needs. At the same time, rising longevity is introducing new complications. The parents of today's pre-retirees and retirees are living longer than any prior generation and very often require greater emotional, physical, and financial support. So we all need to acknowledge that population aging brings with it opportunities and challenges that must be understood and harnessed. Global populations are benefiting from increased longevity, uh, presenting new opportunities to capture unique skill sets um, from increased longevity um, and, and experiences that um, uh, would be able to provide uh, and offer a restart to econ economies, why not? Um, hence, government and industries, be it a healthcare, pharmaceutical, technology, real estate, etc., are urged to be better um, to better understand the opportunities and challenges of older adults um, in this pandemic and in, in this pandemic overall, and to harness their potential to contribute as we restart economies and invest not only in our youth but in the older adult population. Um, some of the things that I often come across working with the older adult population um, is um, uh, ageist type stereotypes. Um, and what that refers to is um, the mentality that older adults are frail or helpless and that they're a burden on society, uh, which of course have led to prejudice and discrimination in a number of different ways. Ageism is a stereotyping of older adults and it perpetuates false information and negative um, images and characteristics regarding this cohort. Um, so I wanna just briefly touch upon some of the more common misconceptions about older adults. Um, and that uh, the, one of the first ones um, is that chrono chronologic age determines oldness. And this refers to the number of years a person has lived. Um, as we all know, the aging process is quite distinct for every individual and each and every one of us ages at widely distinct rates. And some individuals at 85 years old uh, still play golf, swim, hike, drive a car, and participate in a robust um, social life and community activities. And on the opposite spectrum, I've had residents and clients and patients that are in their 50s or 60s um, who are frail and have a multitude of chronic and advanced health conditions and they may need extensive physical assistance with their activities of daily living, be it bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, so on. Uh, and as we all know, exercise and having a healthy and balanced nutrition, limiting emotional and mental stress and other factors um, are thought to play a vital role in healthy aging, physical, social, and mental health parameters, um, life experiences in conjunction with of course our genetic makeup and traits um, all combined to make aging an individualized process. And as always, over and over again, this is something that I say, it is what you do now that, would, that will positively or negatively affect you in your future. Another um, uh, common misconception about older adults is that they have diminished intellectual capacity or, or senility. Um, and although I'm very particular about the, the words that I use, um, the word senile is not a legitimate medical diagnosis. So I do want to point that out. It is a term widely used by the public to denote deteriorating mental fa uh, faculties, be it abilities or talent that are associated with old age. Um, and Can studies- you hear me, Denise? What was that? Can you hear me? This is yeah. Stephanie Caldwell. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. You, now that you've got me scared. <laughs> oh, no. I wasn't already scared. I'm 72 and I'm having trouble kind of cooking and things like that. What is the difference between assisted living and these independent living apartments? And you are a little bit ahead of me. I will be touching upon um, all of the differences and similarities amongst the different communities yeah. later down in the, uh, in the presentation. So I'm hoping that I'll answer uh, most, if not all of your questions. Right. Uh, and if not, you know, we can certainly, um, you know, tag along and, and, and ask uh, other questions as, as they come along. So hopefully uh, I'll answer that question as, as we go on. And I actually have some... Um, uh, videos um, uh, ready for us to see. That way it gives everybody a pretty decent understanding as far as the senior living industry in today's modern age in 2021. 
I guess this is the place we're supposed to be at our age, Sun City. Sun right. City is, is a wonderful place. We are in the hub of, uh, of retirement, and I think um, we, that's a, a step in the right direction. All righty. Thank you. Of course. Um, so as I was saying, studies indicate that intelligence uh, and learning abilities, um, as well as other cognitive skills, do not decline with age. Um, and that these cognitive deficits, deficits are caused by certain risk factors. And of course, whether it is hereditary or if we have diabetes, of course, our eating pattern, our stress level. And of course, uh, for example, nutritional status um, has been singled out as a physical health variable that influences cognitive functioning and particularly me memory performance, regardless of a person's age. And although speed of reaction tends to decrease with age, basic intelligence does not. Um, in fact, some abilities are viewed collectively as crystallized intelligence, such as wisdom and judgment, vocabulary, creativity, common sense, coordination of facts and ideas. And of course, the extensive breadth of knowledge and experience that actually improve with age. Um, another misconception about older adults is that they are resistant to change. Uh, and in some regards, um, I think that is just um, a misconception about really anybody, regardless of age. It is the fear of the unknown, right? Which is completely understandable. Um, and of course, as the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, much needs to be done to promote healthy aging and improve our response to promote healthy aging altogether, um, whether in opportunities and of course, facing challenges uh, in aging in today's world. So one of the things that uh, we do as healthcare professionals is we try to understand the person inside the patient. And of course it pertains to each individual's story, um, health journey, disease process, experience, context, beliefs, culture, spiritual and religious preferences, past experiences, et cetera. We then as family members and powers of attorney for our loved ones, uh, and healthcare professionals have to integrate these elements into the decision-making process for that individual's holistic and patient-centered care. Uh, we have to not only recognize, but fully understand what constructs to make up that individual's physical, social, psychological, and spiritual preferences and circumstances. And uh, you know, with COVID, it really has up, um, upended how we work and how we learn, how we connect socially. And obviously this is a fact here today, we are meeting virtually as opposed to meeting in, in person. Um, COVID has changed so many different things in terms of how we receive care and how we participate in the marketplace. Um, nonetheless, COVID has affected everyone to larger or smaller extents, um, yet this great disruption has been particularly devastating for older people who have suffered economic hardship, number one, and in turn have also become um, socially isolated and faced with a sting of ageism. And it's a sting that like the virus itself can be deadly. Um, older people belonging to certain racial and ethnic minorities um, remain especially at risk. Um, and you know we have to look at the whole system altogether when we work with families and their loved ones in planning for the future and aging in place, whether it be it at home, or in an environment that uh, will meet their needs as they, as they progress in their disease. Um, I know a lot of families that meet with us have asked about um, Department of Health regulations that have uh, been updated recently pertaining to COVID-19 um, congregate living guidelines for visitation. So it used to be that family members uh, had to visit their loved ones um, virtually or through a wall or through um, a window in communities. And now that the community is opening back up, um, we see a larger extent of family members having the sigh of relief, right, of um, kind of picking up where they left off, um, whether it was last year or several months ago, and they're now starting to re-explore and reconsider um, transitioning themselves or a loved one in a community setting, uh, be it a group home or memory care, assisted living, or a um, life plan community with all of those uh, needs uh, readily available to, to truly age in, in place. And I think we're done with that slide.
He's being stubborn. Hang on here. There we go. All right, this is a loaded slide, so bear with me. And as I go through some of these questions, of course, each one of your uh, thought process and your answers will be different because we are all individuals, right? But these are good questions to ask yourself um, pertaining to um, end of life, um, your emotional and physical well being. Um, and one of the things I do want to mention we can't plan for everything, but we can talk about what is most important in our life and in our health care with those who care for us and have many of those care and end of life wishes in writing and of course in multiple copies and in multiple places. And of course, hope is not a plan. So again, some food for thought questions uh, I have written down here is how do I know what kind of long term care I need and what will help if my care needs change over time and all of these questions to some extent. Um, I will be answering as I progress in the in the presentation. Um, and if I don't answer your specific question, please let me know and I'd be I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, what kind of long term care choices do I have? How will I pay for long term care services I may need? And in the future, I may become unable to care for myself and may need help beyond what my family and friends can provide. Do I want to receive services in my home or move to a place in the community where services are provided? And if I need to move to a residential facility within the community, what features are most important to me? Have I talked with my family and friends about helping me when I get older or unable to do things for myself? How do I start a conversation with my family about my or their long-term needs? Do I have pets that need to be cared for? Um, and pertaining to healthy living, am I living a healthy life and making healthy lifestyle choices? Do I have health coverage and a healthcare home or primary care provider? Do I know and follow the advice of my support team and healthcare providers? Do I have records of important healthcare documents that describe major illnesses or hospitalizations? Do I exercise? And are you being and taking the right steps proactively? Uh, and with regards to your emotional well being, am I satisfied with my retirement lifestyle or could I enjoy myself more? How can I make sure I don't become isolated or depressed? What are the signs of depression? And when should I or a loved one um, seek help? And from whom do I have family or friends or healthcare providers who can recognize changes in my emotional or uh, psychological state and provide assistance when needed? And how important are my spiritual practices? Uh, of course, there are some legal implications and legal questions to ask yourself. If I become unable to make decisions on my, my behalf, do I have a legal document in which you name a person to be a proxy um, to be able to make your decisions for you if you become unable to do so? Do I have written instructions and where are they? Um, who do I call if I have questions about scams? And just uh, a, a few hours ago, I was sitting in on a presentation and uh, her name is Jennifer Pitt. She has a company that she came up with and it, it is called Voice Against Fraud. Uh, and she actually teaches families how to not become victims of fraud and scam. So I thought that was very interesting. I'd be more than happy to provide you with her contact information as well. And uh, if I become, uh, if I get to the point of no longer being able to care for myself, um, where do I go for help? Um, where do you get legal advice? Have you made funeral plans, right? These are all questions to start thinking about now. The sooner, the better. Um, do I know what my questions are about legal planning? Um, have I um, had these discussions again through and through and these will change and may change in time. So it's a good to revisit them every so often with your family members and those near and dear to you. And of course, you can always update them in writing in your advanced medical directives as um, your personality and wishes may change. Um, one of the things that I found, found very interesting um, is uh, some statistics pertaining to th this very uh, thing that I'm addressing here. So it says that among people over the age of 50, about 50% 50 of them have a will, four in 10 have a healthcare directive, and just one third of people over the age of 50 have both a will and a healthcare directive. So you can put things in perspective and understand that 
a lot of individuals are not planning for the future for whatever the reason. Uh, fear, it's a taboo in a way to talk about aging, um, just as it is with death. But it's important to address them again sooner rather than later. All right. So um, in, in my presentation, I wanted to kind of start off with how it usually happens, right? So usually a medical emergency happens. 911 is summoned. Just a second, my little puppy came into the office. Let me let her out. <laughs> That never happens in an in-person meeting, does it? All right. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> the positives of the pandemic. <laughs> sure is. Working from home. And playing with your dog at the same time. <laughs> so as I was saying, um, usually it happens with a hospitalization. 911 is summoned. Uh, and of course, many of us um, don't know how to navigate that medical emergency unless you have a loved one or are a healthcare professional yourself to be able to steer you in the right direction to um, help answer a lot of those scary questions for you as far as what will happen. What are, what are these medications that they're giving me? What are these procedures? Um, to what extent are they invasive? Are they not? And ultimately, unfortunately, um, most emergency um, medicine and emergency departments are not geared towards age-friendly health um, incorporation. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about here. Um, last week, I was sitting in on a conference call um, with a, a number of different doctors presenting, and they were um, depicting the importance of holistic, age-friendly health care. Um, so I know Banner University Medical Center is one of the uh, institutions that has been accredited and recognized as uh, being age friendly and they incorporate the four M's within their practice as clinicians and that this is something that I have incorporated as well, not knowingly, to be honest, in my practice as a nurse, is when I meet with family members, we really discuss the um, aspect of care, um, short-term goals, long-term goals, and everything in between. So uh, we tr really try to spoon feed you and help you prioritize what we need to do based on your circumstances, whether um, you're still in the hospital, or you're looking to go back home with uh, in-home care support, or you're not able to go back home for a, a period of time, be it a short term uh, of two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, maybe a few months until you recover and build up that strength, maybe from a surgery or from a fall. Um, so, you know, we really try to make things as easy as, as possible for you. And of course, in the current um, healthcare system today, there's a lot of overwhelm and anxiety for individuals, especially older adults that, um, that enter through the front porch, which is the emergency department. A lot of them, uh, especially now with the COVID pandemic, have had to be dropped off by loved ones. And of course, loved ones are not able to accompany them to be able to uh, explain thoroughly what their medical history is. Um, a lot of them maybe even coming from group homes. And again, there's a gap in communication. And unfortunately, everything is uh, embedded in how information is relayed because you have to be efficient, effective. And of course, it's a two-way street as far as understanding um, what your options are and to be fully informed. So the four M's that I have depicted here um, are what matters, medication, mentation, uh, an individual's ability to um, have good um, cognition and ability to recognize themselves and others, and, and of course, mobility. So when um, clinicians, physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, and nurses it, within a healthcare environment um, address and assess an individual over the age of um, 55, 65, that, that is coming through their door in, in the emergency department, they have to look at things from a holistic standpoint because certain medications may not be the solution for somebody that um, has delirium or dementia or an infection, right? So you, it's almost uh, having to, to take a step back approach and dive into the big picture, but also zoom in on the details, as I say. So it's very multifaceted. Um, and when, when working with, with 
clinicians and, and other practitioners in the industry, um, I, I especially enjoy that attention to detail because it's the attention to detail that transcribes into successful patient outcomes. All right. Next slide. I'm cranking on my laptop here. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. This must have been a great slide. It doesn't want to go anywhere. Well, um, you know, next step is practically leaving the hospital, right? So now what? Are you able to Not yet. work? Some reason it's frozen. There we go. There it is. All right, so after all is said and done, you've been there for a few days, you're a little bit more stable, you have some more peace of mind um, health-wise, um, you can kind of see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but of course, it's still a lot to take in. So you may be frazzled, of course, overwhelmed, anxious, and there's a lot of moving parts that come with this. So. Again, something that I always say is you don't know what you don't know and what you don't know can hurt you. So it's a matter of um, leading up to the discharge date, right? So you're in the hospital or a loved one is in the hospital and what usually ends up happening is a social worker or a case manager, really a team of multi um, interdisciplinary healthcare professionals will, um, have, will have been on your case for, for, for the duration of hospitalization. And from that point forward, uh, they will meet with you and consult with you and any other decision makers, family members, spouse, power of attorney, guardian, conservator, uh, fiduciary, you name it. And they will um, most likely um, hand you a list of different skilled nursing facilities. If let's say your you know, prognosis is six months more um, and end of life is not necessarily nearby, they will hand you over a list of different skilled nursing facilities, rehab centers, um, and the like. And you will have to choose rather soon, which one you will be going um, and transitioning into for that sk uh, skilled nursing need, whether it's physical, occupational, or, and or speech therapy. So of course, you know, as a consumer yourself, how are you supposed to know out of a list of 20, 30, and of course, based on your insurance, how and which one of those really is uh, aligning with what your goals are, number one, and of course that provide that quality care that you're seeking to get back on your feet, to go back home and to live your life. Um, and of course, these are all put things, uh, I'll, I'll put in, in perspective, so to speak, based on your wishes, right? On your prognosis, maybe you have a, a prognosis of three or four or five months to live. And of course, that's just an estimated period of time, um, usually deemed appropriate by a physician. And maybe hospice or palliative care is summoned and uh, brought into the discussion. Or maybe you need to go back home, but you're still not good on your feet. You're still, you're still a little bit unsteady. Maybe you need to implement some non-medical and medical in-home care services. Um, for a respite or a longer period of time to come in and support you with your activities of daily living. Um, so there are a lot of questions and a lot of overwhelm that need to be addressed. And of course, you need to be fully informed so that you can make an, uh, an educated and confident decision ultimately. Uh, another thing that I, I see very often is polypharmacy. Uh, medication mismanagement. So polypharmacy refers to um, the administration and prescription of more than a few medications. So a lot of my clients um, have upwards of 10 or 15, sometimes even 20 prescription medications. Uh, they may have two or three anti-hypertensives. Um, they may have diabetes with insulin and a pill. They may have cholesterol medications. Um, and the list goes on. 
So um, then it leads us into the next, um, the next PowerPoint slide. And this is just an overview of some of the um, community resources and living and care environments that I will be touching upon some more briefly and others a little bit more in depth. Next slide. All right, so adult daycare centers. And again, as, as I often say, there is a moment in time for everything. As with anything in life, there are advantages and disadvantages to each individual living and or care service and environment um, depicted on the previous slide. And there is no perfect place and there, are, there, are, there is no perfect um, environment, but it's up to you as an individual and family to um, understand your options fully. Again, knowing what your options are based on the circumstance. And again, things may arise as time goes on, emergencies happen, right? These are unforeseen events that you do not and cannot plan for, but some of them you can plan for. Um, one of the beautiful and amazing things about Benavia is uh, their adult daycare um, centers and their program. And of course, programs vary from um, environment to environment. Um, but of course, um, it, it's up to you and, a, uh, and maybe a geriatric care manage, manager or whatever resource you're utilizing to help you uh, navigate through these options. Um, one of the things I want to say is the act of caregiving is no small feat. It's a tough task tempered by love and loyalty, but regardless of how devoted you are to your aging loved one, whether as a family and or sole caregiver, you can't do it all by yourself. Whether you're relying on the support of another family member or even a neighbor um, to provide you with respite from caregiving, it truly does take a village. And for family members, uh, and for families, this is where adult daycare centers may come into play. Um, they provide services that keep individuals busy and cognitively engaged, and it allows family caregivers to keep working or to take a periodic break from caregiving. Um, with some adult daycare centers, you are able to customize the extent of days and hours you wish to have your loved one um, there based on your needs and schedule. And of course, financial affordability comes into play. Uh, and it certainly can be a great solution if a family cannot afford full-time in-home care um, and if your loved one has early to early intermediate stages of dementia um, or can no longer structure their own daily activities. Uh, another reason why you may want to consider adult daycare centers is that some individuals may find it difficult to initiate activities such as reading or engaging in previous hobbies that they once enjoyed participating in. Uh, and of course, the isolation and loneliness factor that come into play as well, um, and desires for peer interaction and cognitive simulation that they provide. Um, anxiety and depression is, seems to be um, escalating by the year. And of course, with COVID, um, it's, it's been more impacted, uh, especially in the older adult population. So the need for social and emotional support um, and interaction um, really has never been greater. And uh, the nice thing about adult daycare centers is that they really provide a range of different activities um, from trivia games, arts and crafts, group conversations, counseling, support groups, um, such as the ones that Benavia provide and card and board games, music and art therapy, exercise, I mean, the list goes on and it really can be whether a short term or a long term solution for family members um, to test the water, to give back to themselves as caregivers. Um, there are emotions that are running high, guilt, um, sadness, denial, right? And it's very important to reach out for help. All right. Going into home health care, I wanted to put these side by side as um, I wanted to depict the, the differences, the distinct differences uh, amongst these. I find that a lot of individuals and families that I come across may um, misunderstand and misconstrue them. So uh, when it comes to home health care, uh, there is non-medical, also known as non-skilled home care, and medical which is also known as skilled home health. So I'll be um, going down in terms of the differences um, uh, amongst the two. Non-medical 
are, um, it's, it's a service that provides assistance with activities of daily living, be it bathing, dressing, grooming, um, toileting, transferring assistance in and out of bed, in and out of wheelchair. Um, they do meal preparation and med medication reminders. That's something that I want to kind of emphasize, the medication reminders. As a non-medical in-home care agency, they're not able to disperse medications. Um, that's where a medical home health company or a private duty um, um, home health company would come into play. Uh, they are able to do light housekeeping and grocery shopping, um, taking individuals to and from um, doctor's appointments um, and, and the like, uh, and of course, companion care. Usually non-medical in-home care services are private pay and they charge by the hour, um, anywhere from $27 and up, depending on the extent of care needs and that they are providing. Um, and they usually have a three to four hour minimum per visit. Of course, you're able to customize the extent of hours that you want to entertain their services. And the more you enter entertain their services, the more cost effective it becomes. So something to consider. Now, medical, also known as skilled home health, is uh, rather common in individuals that are um, getting out of the hospital and whether going back home in their own personal residence or even going back to an assisted living or a memory care or a residential assisted living home. And these medical services constitute of nursing um, services, so a nurse, a physical, occupational, and speech therapy, a social worker is involved, and they also provide nursing assistance. Uh, certified nursing assistants. Um, medical home health agencies are state licensed, and so they have to meet very stringent cr criteria um, in order to qualify individuals um, for their service. And uh, skilled home health is billed through insurance, whereas non-medical is usually out of pocket. Okay, any questions so far? All right. I'm just going to fly through these. I just wanted to kind of give you a, um, a 180 degree uh, over, overview of, um, again, community resources and facilities available um, upon hospitalization or uh, on the way back, on the journey back home. Um, so some skilled nursing facilities within the Valley are very common for individuals to transition into. Uh, they are the ones that provide um, a skilled care. So, and a lot of these may have a nursing home wing for long-term care residents that need around the clock nursing care and supervision. Um, and so again, some of these care facilities actually operate as both with a separate floor or a section of the building devoted specifically whether to a skilled nursing facility or a long-term nursing home. Um, skilled nursing care is provided by, of course, a trained registered nurse in a medical setting, and they have a doctor that supervises and dictates uh, each individual's plan of care. And patients are typically uh, transitioned again from the hospital, and they recover after an illness or injury, um, be it a surgery or a fall, why not? And in addition to skilled nursing care, um, care can also be uh, in, including the physical occupational speech therapy. So individuals that have potentially had strokes or um, are a little bit weaker pertaining to their mobility. And again, they have goals to meet. Should they meet them and progress, they will be in a skilled nursing facility longer uh, until uh, their insurances are up. And of course, sometimes a lot of individuals may, may plateau. And if that is to be the case, they would need to be discharged into either a back home or a long-term care um, assisted living type of environment. Um, then we have inpatient rehabilitation facilities. These are um, in a way an extension of the hospital. So these next two um, categories of the IRF and LTAX, long-term care acute care hospitals, provide more, um, more intensive and coordinated care uh, from a, a team of interdisciplinary professionals. For uh, an inpatient acute rehab, therapy is very extensive. So as it states there, it's a minimum of two therapies, whether it's physical, occupational, or speech therapy. 
at least two of those, and it's three hours per day, five days a week. Uh, of course, you have to qualify um, medically, so there is an extensive admission process um, that is um, underway, um, but individuals in this category may have had um, uh, organ transplants or uh, spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, major burns, um, or even complex trauma from a, a motor vehicle accident, uh, maybe a complex stroke um, or other neurological and orthopedic conditions. Then we have long-term acute care hospitals. Um, we don't have too many of those, but there are a few. And uh, many people have never heard of long-term care acute care hospitals because the services are specifically designed for people with unique medical needs. Uh, and these types of individuals require serious care following a trip to the ED or an increase in symptom of a chronic illness that they live with. So these LTACs, they specialize in the treatment of patients with serious medical conditions and they require care on an ongoing basis, um, of course, but they're no longer requiring the intensive care or extensive diagnostic procedures within that hospital environment. So usually they'll be transferred over to an LTAC facility. Uh, and of course, simultaneously, they may require rehabilitation um, services such as the therapies to um, evolve and progress back to the, maybe a new baseline. Um, one of the averages length of stays of a person that it transition in, uh, transitions into an LTAC is approximately 30 days, but it varies um, anywhere from 40 to uh, 10 to 40 days. And uh, again, the focus is on critical pa um, care patients. They have um, a better staff to resident ratio for, to be able to care for critically ill um, individuals. And um, some of these individuals that you can expect to find in an LTAC uh, may require a ventilator to assist in breathing or weaning. Uh, they may have ongoing dialysis for renal failure. Um, they may have intensive respiratory care, whether because of COVID or not. And they, um, a lot of them may even have multiple IV medications or transfusions for cardiac care. Um, and, and, and to kind of uh, round out the list, a lot of times individuals out in the community um, may have uh, pressure ulcers, which uh, escalate and get to be quite extensive, and of course, they would need to transition in one, any one of these environments. Denise, I wanted to take a second here. Nola, Nola Hara, I couldn't tell if you had your hand raised or not. Did you have a question? Actually, my question was not particularly to this particular slide, but my question is, is this going to be, these slides going to be available for downloading or looking at later? Yes, Every, everything from the presentation plus the uh, slideshow itself will be on YouTube afterwards. I'll give you all that information when we wrap up, but yep, we will have Great. it all available to you. Thanks. And I know it's a lot of information. I just want to at least give you a snippet of an overview um, of these services um, and communities out there. Uh, you can find in this slide some wonderful pictures depicting at the, the top two are um, senior living communities. Uh, most of them have independent living and assisted living and even memory care neighborhoods. And the bottom two are, believe it or not, residential assisted living homes. So a lot of things have changed in the last um, decade and not to mention the last two or three decades um, pertaining to nursing homes um, because nursing homes still do, they, they still exist, um, but the concept of aging in place and senior living and housing has ch changed dramatically uh, with, the, uh, with the advancement in technology. Uh, and I'll be touching upon some of these um, here shortly. One of the things I wanted to mention to you, uh, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they think that living at home is free. Actually, living at home isn't free. So as a homeowner, you know the cost. There is insurance and taxes and property maintenance and improvements. There are utilities and groceries and even possibly landscaping or clean services. And every so often there's a new hot water heater or new faucets or fixtures to be uh, put in, new appliances. And once in a while, there's a new roof or carpeting or painting, HVAC, sewer lines to clear, and water where it shouldn't be or not showing up where it should. 
and how much um, all of this home ownership costs. Of course, these are some things that you would have to depict um, you know, with pen and paper, but when you add it up, including all the mortgage payments, you're still obligated to make when you have the set of numbers in hand, you'll have a good starting point for understanding what it costs to live at home. And then there's more because when your plan is to age in place, you'll also want to think about the modifications that your home may require to keep you safe and life simple. So some of these things that you want to consider are, you know, getting rid of those um, liable to, tri uh, to trip you throw rugs, right? You throw them out. Uh, you want to install grab bars near the tub and toilet. Um, and you might want to widen the doorways and remodel a bathroom or two. Uh, you wanna install lifts or ramps if you have a two-story home and even replace doorknobs with handles. Uh, while these are mostly one-time expenses, they can add up to a major price tag, of course. So it's part of the price you pay to age in place at home and all of those home ownership costs plus the cost of ensuring your home is an even safer and more secure place for the years ahead. But wait, there's more. Aging in place at home also means being prepared to bring into your home the, um, the, the services and the providers uh, who are able to help you age in place successfully, hopefully. And you can and probably should research the cost for in-home care in your community. Um, but as I had mentioned, uh, the in-home care, non-medical and medical um, would be able to be a, an inter interim or a long-term um, solution for you. Um, but of course, you sometimes may even want to wire your home with smart technologies and, you know, in order to monitor your behavior or medications, or you may want to uh, get, a, get a GPS emergency life alert pendant um, or a medication dispensing machine. And all of these things add up. So practically, living at home isn't free. Um, I'll be speaking about the major differences and similarities amongst these senior living communities. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to point out is today's seniors don't see retirement as a time to relax, um, but more as a time of a transition. So a time to turn their attention to the joys of life, family, friends, hobbies, adventures, and increasingly seniors want enriching lifestyles that give them, gives them the services and amenities to enjoy an engaging and entertaining life full of experiences. Um, one of the things that I often hear again is aging in place, but seniors and their loved ones see communities where resident centered care and aging in place are more than just nice sounding catchphrases and buzzwords. And it's important for you to understand uh, that not all communities are created equal, right? Just because they have a, a Department of Health regulation, um, uh, Department of Health um, license does not mean that they are, uh, that your loved one should transition in that XYZ assisted living um, and, and the list goes on. So here I'm I wanna talk about independent living and then I have a short video just to kind of give you um, a little overview. I think we should start that, Jay, maybe first. Uh, I think it'll help um, give you a pretty good sense of what independent living and senior living communities are in today's age. Do you have it, Jay? You're still on mute. Is it not showing? No. It's okay. It's showing on my end. <laughs> okay. Let's Maybe we'll have to bypass that. But um, uh, Live Generations is a beautiful senior living community um, in North Scottsdale, and they have amazing grounds um, of really thought out floor plans, number one. And the concept of senior living really is um, put on a pedestal there. Um, independent living, assisted living and memory care is what they offer. And they really, in that video, I think it's about three minutes, they highlight 
um, some of their uh, bistros. And as is de depicted here on the slide, independent living communities have um, a plethora of different um, activities and um, a, a, an engaging lifestyle. Um, residents are able to utilize all of these amenities and services from the theater to the swimming pool. They have a wellness clinic and fitness, fitness centers um, for birthday parties. They have private dining rooms um, and you would be able to um, uh, reserve those, whether for, again, birthday parties or just because with families and loved ones. They have demonstration kitchens where you're able to utilize um, that common space to cook or demonstrate um, baking. Uh, and of course, they have beauty salons and barber shops and um, plenty of courtyards with walking paths. Um, one thing that I want you to understand, and this will uh, be built upon later in the, in the next few slides, is Independent living is just that. It's independent living. It's a full service maintenance free lifestyle. So they have uh, certain services that, they're, that they are able to provide, but they do not provide any type of hands on or medical care, right? So um, they have uh, standard cable TV and all utilities except personal phone and internet included in the rent. Um, and you have the choice of studio or one bedroom, one bedroom with den, two bedroom apartments, and even villas and casitas with um, garages and covered parking to choose from, of course. Um, based on the floor plans, you would be able to um, depict whether that would be in your price point or not. Just like in real estate, it's location, 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 and you in a way do pay uh, based on the size of the apartment. Um, they have some safety and security features uh, with 24-7 on-site concierge service. Um, so in the event of an emergency, you are able to press your um, GPS emergency call pendant. Some of them even may have a pull down cord uh, throughout the apartment itself uh, for not another added feature of safety and support and peace of mind. And of course, not to mention the chef prepared dining experience, uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, you, if you've never been to a senior living community in the last few years, um, I urge you to, um, and now with COVID as they're opening back up, I think it would be a great um, way to at least introduce you to what senior living is and what it's not, because it's not um, the, uh, the exemplified thought about community of nursing homes and individuals sitting around a table with adult bibs. Of course, that's not to say that those types of places don't exist as every individual has different needs. And of course, as they progress in their disease process and aging, they will need more hands-on extensive care. But independent living is a great way to, um, to live out your life, to enjoy the things you, you enjoy doing. Uh, it's a full calendar of event uh, that they provide from morning till evening and everything from social, recreational, uh, educational seminars. Um, they offer housekeeping, linen service and maintenance and scheduled transportation to and from doctor's appointments, um, church services, grocery shopping, and so on. We can't hear you, Jay. I mean, I was just gonna butt in and say, we have a question for Mary Shank. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Mary. Uh, good. Okay, so um, my husband and I, um, for a long time, were pretty interested, but never actually got around to looking at all the available um, independent living facilities that are out in West Valley. But then COVID came around and we saw how isolated people were and, um, you know, confined to their rooms. And I'm wondering if um, you've, you've been able to address that concern at all. Have you? I've actually worked with many families in your, in your, in your shoes. So last year, right around this time, uh, maybe a few weeks prior uh, to this whole COVID um, madness, uh, I was touring with families left and right. We were touring group homes, bigger communities, and right in the midst of it, uh, of course, with COVID, we had to put things to a stop or on pause completely. And um, I don't know if I'm understanding your question clearly, so please let me know if I'm not answering that. But pertaining to COVID, you know, a lot of communities have done a wonderful job in terms of adapting to, again, this unforeseen event. Who would have thought 
that we would have been in a pandemic, right? Um, whether you're younger or older, or you were planning and anticipating this transition or starting that discovery process, um, I think it's important um, to be safe and to be mindful and cautious. But now that uh, the vaccinations um, have been implemented within the community for herd immunity, um, most communities, you know, upwards of 85, 90 some percent uh, of their residents have been vaccinated. So it does make life living within the environment that much easier, number one. And number two, it makes for peace of mind all throughout. Of course, there are still uh, um, regulations and guidelines per uh, CDC and Department of Health regulations that communities are abiding by. But I think now that we've been through this for several months, we are getting a little bit better at um, making more informed decisions and implementing that while still giving back to uh, the residents living in a community. Yeah. Uh -uh. Oops. Right. She muted herself the other way. Did I answer your question, Mary? You're still on mute, Mary. There you go. Okay. Um, Yes, I think really it's an unanswerable question, though, to be true, because we don't know if another COVID will come, you know, in five years, in 20 years, or when, whatever. But um, it is something to keep under consideration when making that decision, is, is, is what I'm thinking. Right. And, and, and I think I'll address more of these questions, whether families and, you know, as a family decision, whether you are thinking of going down the list of, aging in place solutions, whether short term or long term, whether living at home or pondering and with the idea of let's explore some options. What are those options based on your finances, based on availability, based on the part of town you live in, right? We look at the, you know, the big picture and kind of um, personalize our assessment and consultation with you um, to really hopefully hit the nail on the head and give you some viable and sustainable options. Yeah, absolutely. Very nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so assisted living, right? Uh, maintaining independence uh, is an important um, aspect for people as they age. And in fact, losing it is one of the biggest fears seniors have. Um, an overwhelming majority want to remain in their ho homes, of course, and understandably so. But the reality is that one in five individuals um, over the age of 85 say that they either need or currently receive help with activities of daily living. Is there a way to get that kind of help and still be as independent as possible? Yes, and it is called assisted living. Um, according to the National Center for Assisted Living, there are um, a, a plethora of individuals with different activities of daily living support care needs and about 84% of them need help with bathing, about 62% of them need help with walking, 68% of them need help with dressing, 61% of them need help with toileting, 43% uh, need help with bed transfers, and about 32% need help with eating. So in assisted living, think of the previous slide pertaining to independent living. Uh, most communities uh, nowadays and in Arizona um, have thought about the continuum of care um, aspect of aging in place. And what that means is an individual is able to transition from home into a senior living community uh, and not have to relocate to another campus um, with a if should their needs uh, increase in time or should they require more hands-on assistance. So some of these communities are um, licensed with the Department of, of Health Services in such a way that if and in the event that an individual is to require a little bit more personal um, or directed care services, once they are already living in that apartment, let's say independent living, and if that apartment is also licensed through the state as an assisted living directed care license um, um, ability, that individual would not have to pack up and relocate to the other um, uh, side of the, or wing of the, the, uh, of the community. So think of assisted living as all of the amenities and services depicted in independent living, 
but the only um, difference really is the 24 hour, seven day, 365 day a year supervision and hands on care. And this care is provided by trained, licensed, and certified care staff. So again, 24 seven around the clock um, assistance with any and all of the activities of, of daily living, be it bathing, dressing, grooming, incontinence care, medication management administration. Um, of course, one thing I do want to mention, uh, of course, not all communities are cre created equal. So a lot of these communities may not be able to accept somebody that is uh, non weight bearing and that may need a two person transfer assistance or a Hoyer lift. Right. So this is where working with um, an individual such as myself would come into play to help you weed through some of those options and we do the legwork for you. Uh, I do have a 360 virtual tour um, of one of the apartments uh, that they have in uh, uh, live generations at Pinnacle Peak. I don't know if you're able to get that going, Jay. Let's see. Coming up. I can't see it. I don't know if everybody else can or. Don't have a black screen with, there it is. It's not sharing, sharing. No, it's not. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I get to watch it, everybody. Darn it. <laughs> Once it's up on YouTube and all the links are out there, you can go ahead and look at these when, when they're up in line. We'll have to put in the link uh, in the comment section in YouTube and um, yeah. that way it'll make it easier for everybody to refer back to. I thought it, I wanted it to be a very engaging you know, kind of boots on the ground experience for the audience to, to really envision what a community is uh, and the, the size of the living arrangement simultaneously. Let's see. Okay. So because I love misconceptions, I, I thought to depict some of the ones that I frequently come across uh, with my families and clients. And this is in no particular order. But one of the ones that really, um, really moves me is the first one. Moving to a senior living community means losing independence. Not true. Senior living sets you free to do more of what you love actually. And assisted living is about preserving your independence for longer by making life easier. Um, you'll enjoy the privacy of your own home and you are able to, um, to utilize the space and furnish it uh, with your personal, pride of possessions uh, and make it as homey and as cozy as you'd like. Um, while you maintain your independence, you'll lose the stress of maintenance and upkeep and you'll be free uh, from the hassles of cooking, sign me up, housework, sign me up and maintenance. Um, so I don't have to you know, have my honey to-do list, for example, and you can spend more time focusing on the people you love and the things you love to do. So senior living is truly all about you. You are at the core of what their philosophy is. Another misconception um, is moving to an assisted living or retirement community means giving up hobbies and interests. Um, most independent living communities offer a wide range of different activities and social events, as I had mentioned previously, and they're really tailored to your needs and interests. Uh, everything from sports and fitness programs to gardening, book clubs, cards, arts and crafts, um, adult education classes. Many older adults find that they're actually more active and social when they move to a community of some, uh, of some kind, which helps them feel healthier, happier, and really less isolated, as you had mentioned, Mary. Um, most of today's seniors are no longer content resting and relaxing in their lazy boys. That's another misconception that I find is tagged on to older adults. And as they're not sitting in front of their TVs, uh, every single day for hours on end. And, you know, these communities really provide a variety of outings and activities. Um, and, and one thing to keep in mind is no one will force you to participate in any one of these. So no one is demanding a set schedule from you. The residents are free to try new things and discover new hobbies. Um, and again, you're not tied to household responsibilities. Misconception number three, I can't afford moving into a senior living community. I think I had just touched upon some of the aspects that come with living at home and living at home is not for free, right? So senior living may actually be the more affordable choice. Uh, with senior living, the financial benefits often prove equal to or greater than the social benefits. 
the time and costs associated with home maintenance and aging in place and it can increase as you age. And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, a few little projects can turn into several big projects over the years. And that ultimately takes time and money away from your interests and passions. Uh, your life at a senior living community is really all inclusive, meaning that your food and housing and maintenance costs are all bundled together and there are amenities aplenty included as well. So as you think about how the benefits and expenses stack up, be sure to consider the intangible costs. So they can be significant factors in your decision making process. Um, um, one of the things um, I also wanted to um, kind of put out there the cost of your senior living residence per month really is dictated and it depends upon the floor plan you choose ultimately, right? And uh, amongst the location within the community and the number of people living in that residence also um, comes, into, comes into play. So consider for a moment what you are giving up and what you will be gaining. Even if you no longer have a mortgage, home ownership um, is costly. So you have insurance, taxes, upkeep, repairs, utilities, gym memberships, dining, activities and entertainment, emergency expenses and more. And really some families look into senior living um, as, uh, you know, gosh, I'm surprised to, to know of the, the monthly rate. So they have that initial sticker shock. But while cost varies depending on apartment size or levels of care, the average cost of senior living is often comparable or even less than receiving the same services and support at home. So when you look at things in perspective, um, if you are to stay at home, and again, I'm not for or against, but I do believe there's a time and place for any and every one of these services or communities, why not? Um, staying at home with 24-7 in-home care services, non-medical, can really add up. So if you do the math, $27 plus dollars an hour times 24-7 care, right? 24 hours a day, 30 days a week, that's a lot. In comparison to a, an assisted living or a residential or a memory care environment that would be able to cover that for you know, a fraction of the cost. Um, misconception number four, senior living communities are only for older and more in need seniors and senior living communities have changed tremendously from decades ago. Um, so, you know, today's seniors are choosing community living more for the lifestyle as opposed to the need. Uh, and there's no right age to make the, the move anymore. Uh, most of these communities have a, an age limit usually 65, sometimes 55, 62, it just depends. And they're able to, uh, again, get you away from the home maintenance and cooking and cleaning and really provide you with the, the whole golden age experience. All right, next slide. Trying to hurry on through these, gosh. Uh, misconception number five, moving is too difficult. I'll just wait until I need the care to settle into a senior living community. Actually making the decision to move into a senior living community before you actually need the care services and support makes actually the, more, the most sense. If you wait until an illness or a health crisis occurs, um, you or your family may be forced to pick a community based on availability, which all too often um, we're faced with as uh, care advocates and not desirability. So why not only move once? That's something that I always pose to my clients. Many senior living communities have higher levels of care, such as assisted living, memory care, and some of them may even have a skilled nursing or rehab wing that you can take advantage of without the worry of moving again. So should things advance uh, and you need to be hospitalized, you can even potentially go within the wing of a skilled nursing rehabilitation center within the community that you were living prior to hospitalization to continue your recovery. And so the concept of truly aging in place until the end of life really does occur with some of these communities. All right, memory care. Next slide. I'm sure we've all heard of memory care or Alzheimer's and dementia care neighborhoods, communities, they all refer to the same thing. So um, in the early stages of Alzheimer's or a form of dementia, an older adult might be able to remain in their home or move in with a loved one who acts as a caregiver. But the, con the condition does progress, right? And so safety and security and quality of life might decline. And in these cases, a memory care environment is um, the more optimal um, senior living solution. 
as they are specifically designed for the safety of people with memory impairment. And staff really is trained to handle the challenges that often accompany Alzheimer's and dementia, be it wandering or sundowning or behavioral outbursts. Um, I have some fun statistics um, and again, some harsh reality statistics. Uh, six plus million Americans of all ages are living with Alzheimer's and this is only projected to rise to about 14 million by 2050. And one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. So you can imagine that this is a very progressive and um, uh, new age disease. Um, so really these communities have done, I think, a wonderful job in, uh, in acknowledging and incorporating technology into their community, um, whether it's robotic pets. So in a lot of the memory care um, communities, uh, some of them may be able to provide residents with these pets to hold and response and respond to the, um, the lifelike animals that they have. Uh, different monitoring devices are able to be implemented to, uh, to track heart rates. Um, again, the GPS detector uh, pendants and motion detectors in the event that somebody has the, um, the agitation or, or the overwhelm to get up out of bed and they may not be safe. Residential care homes. So this is rather a new concept. Um, and here in Arizona, we're very blessed to have a, a variety of different such environments because this is the way that I think um, a lot of other states should be uh, going about senior living and care is incorporating more of a non-institutionalized um, approach to senior living and care. I don't know about you, but for myself and my loved ones, um, I. I have fear of institutions and even as a nurse myself, when I go into hospitals or skilled nursing centers or rehabs, my anxiety is amplified. Uh, can you imagine that for somebody with cognitive loss, with depression, with post-traumatic stress disorder, veterans, right? So when you put things in perspective, a residential care home is really the best option for somebody that um, may want to be more on a budget and it's more sustainable and accessible in cost, number one. And they too provide 24 hands-on care and supervision uh, only in a home-like intimate environment. So if you were to drive by in, a, in your residential community, for example, I know the Sun Cities, Sun City West and Sun City Grand do not permit group homes, but Peoria, Glendale, Surprise, and any other city really, um, they have group homes that you may not know are group homes. You've probably driven by group homes or have visited friends or loved ones in such environments. And the capacity of each one of them really um, differs anywhere from five to a maximum of 10 residents. So with that in mind, it really allows staff members the certified nursing assistants, certified caregivers, the assisted living manager to be able to provide more hands-on directed care support, redirection, if they have a memory loss, whether Alzheimer's, dementia, Lewy body, frontal temporal dementia. I mean, there is over 60, 70 types of dementias out there. So they're really well-versed uh, and trained to um, uh, attend to individuals' specific needs as they all have a individual um, care plan that has to be done every three or six months. It's a Department of Health regulation. And within that care plan, it is revised. And that's something that you as decision makers, as families have a say in um, alongside your loved one if they're still able to make decisions on their behalf. This is where that team collaborative effort comes into play and maybe medications need to be tweaked. And again, this is telemedicine. One thing I wanted to mention really is COVID-19 has really um, brought about an emphasis of change in telemedicine and technology, especially as it pertains to senior living. Um, a lot of these house call, uh, these um, physicians provide house call services. And even prior to COVID, that was the case. But now they've, I think, uh, gone about it in a more efficient and effective manner to uh, include 
um, some cardiologists or dermatologists, podiatrists come to the home and it bills insurance directly. So a primary care physician would be able to visit at home um, without you having to schedule transportation and wait in the, in the lobby for upwards of an hour sometimes with your loved one, especially if mobility is to be of concern. So in a residential care home environment, they're able to take care of an individual until the end of life. And they provide three home cooked meals a day and snacks in between. And by the bigger communities, this again, it's a small, intimate family environment. Usually they're, they're family owned and operated. So we do have some negotiating power. Uh, it's uh, sometimes to maybe lock in that rate for life. Uh, depending on each individual's needs. Some of these group homes are able to care for more of that skilled care patient with tracheostomy, with feeding tubes, stroke victims, uh, not to mention, um, again, different types of dementia and diabetes, uh, catheter care, you name it. So anything and everything uh, would be able to um, come underneath this umbrella of residential care homes with a doctor's order. Um, everything is accounted for and each resident has their own resident file. Of course, you as family members have that ultimate say as far as, yes, I want this treatment done for my loved one. If you know them best, that is something that um, providers would want to, um, to respect and dignity comes first. Respect, autonomy, and all-inclusive education is of utmost importance so that really you're working together as a team to uh, provide end-of-life care. Hospice services are able to come into this type of environment or assisted living or a memory care or even in your own personal residence. And we'll be talking briefly a little bit about hospice in the next slide, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've all heard about hospice care. Um, I feel that a lot of my clients um, feel that hospice is an actual facility, and I hate that word. It's not a facility or community, it's a service. So hospice care follows that individual wherever they consider home. Again, whether it's a community for seniors or in their own personal home. And so they really provide that compassionate comfort care. And while the objective of both hospice and palliative care is pain and symptom relief, the prognosis and goals of care tend to be different. So hospice is comfort care without curative intent. That's the key word there, without curative intent. And the patient no longer wants um, or has curative options or has chosen not to pursue them uh, because of the side effects outweighing the benefits sometimes. Uh, and then palliative care is comfort care with or without curative intent. So being on palliative care, you are able to still uh, entertain the services of physical, occupational, and speech therapy, for example. So I'm not going to go more, uh, dive in deeper in this. As you can see, patient and family-centered care is at the very um, middle and the center of the whole hospice care and palliative care philosophy. And so the nurses and therapists, hospice aides, uh, grief counselors, spiritual counselors, social workers, physicians, and volunteers are able to come in and provide the support needed um, for uh, anticipatory grief uh, and as that individual is going about their health journey in hospice. Denise, we have a question from Nola Har. Yes. Yeah, I'm still a little confused uh, between what you mean by palliative and what you mean by hospice. Can you clarify that again for me? Certainly. So hospice care is when an individual has been deemed by a physician to have less than six months to live, a prognosis of six months or less. And of course, they have to meet financial uh, medical criteria to be able to qualify through their Medicare insurance or whatever other right. insurance they may have. Right. Palliative care may be more of the option for individuals that may not necessarily be emotionally ready or mentally ready to go on hospice. Or palliative care is kind of that in between um, okay, let's kind of wait and see if we want to uh, entertain the, the, the services of more curative, aggressive treatment, whether it's chemotherapy. So let's say a cancer patient has uh, been deemed to be in maybe stage three or four uh, cancer. And although they could potentially qualify 
for um, hospice care, they may not be ready. So that's when they would potentially um, entertain palliative care with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, chemotherapy. And if and when they're ready to go on to hospice care at any one point, they can transition. Does that kind of clarify a little bit? Sort of. Let me, let me reiterate what I understand back. Mm -hmm. uh, palliative care is like where they can get treatment for whatever illness until the treatment no longer works and they're ready to go to God, so to speak, ready to end the life. Then when that point arrives, then they go on hospice. Do I have that right? You have that correct. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank of course, with some other nuts and bolts added in there, but yes, for the most part. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. All right, next slide. All right, so in this picture is myself with my lovely great-grandmother, Millie. She turned 93 in December, and growing up, um, I always wanted to be like her. She is very family-oriented. And she is the life of the party, very vibrant, uh, a very young spirit. And if I can be a fourth of who she is, I will consider myself blessed. So one of the things that I wanted to kind of relay this with my great grandmother is that many people are not aware of how difficult caring for parents or senior loved ones can be until their family is confronted with the fact that mom or dad or grandma or great grandma can no longer take care of themselves, uh, or they may need to be moved into a more fitting senior living care environment. And oftentimes people are blindsided by what's involved as the role reverses and parents begin to need more care. But again, there's a cost to aging in a place and your current home may require extensive modifications as I had mentioned, so that it's more comfortable, convenient, safer, and easier for you to use. And this design concept um, is based on making homes usable by multiple generations. And this is actually termed the universal design. And it includes features like single level living space. And that's actually something that's been integrated in the Sun Cities, believe it or not, making it the hub of retirement. And uh, we are in the life and the center in the bone marrow of retirement, which makes us so lucky as we have many options to choose from pertaining to senior living and care. Um, but of course, most of our homes are not wheelchair accessible and they don't have a lever style door handle or non-slip floors and handrails and grab bars. And uh, we know that for most of us, some of our Peter Pan homes are not a permanent and sustainable living solution, even remodeled with elder living in mind. So the Wendy's example is true and right. We can't stay in Neverland forever. And every once in a while I meet with families um, who have decided to face reality sooner rather than later. And they almost universally testify to being freed from servitude to stuff by downsizing and moving to a maintenance-free senior living community while they're still vigorous. You want to make this decision while you're still able to be a part of the process. Oftentimes I find that they are happier, more relieved. And there is a certain joy in being able to do the downsizing themselves rather than have it done for them or to them. And something else to consider while figuring out the cost of aging in a place is how much you spend on your current lifestyle, again, and what you and or your partner, if applicable, may require in the future to maintain your quality of life currently. So what will you do if one of you needs an in-home caregiver to, and to help with activities of daily living, like cooking or cleaning, medication reminders, or what if, what if one of you or the both of you need around the clock care and supervision? Are you uh, financially able and or willing to pay and allocate uh, upwards of fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for twenty-four-seven in-home care. Those are the questions that you have to to think about. So the cost of aging in place may be higher than you think, um, as you may need. Uh, then there are some factors that you might might want to consider again installing a walk-in shower, wheelchair accessible shower. But again, even that may potentially have an expiration date. You invest a lot. And that may not be sustainable as you may have a stroke or a loved one may be, um, again, advancing in their disease process more rapidly than anticipated, right? So you have to look at the bigger picture and really understand what are your options and how to go about um, making the right decision, hopefully the first time. Um, another thing is 
um, a lot of these communities, big and small, are able to do respite, uh, also known as short-term stays. So for those families and individuals that may want to test the water um, or plant the seed and see how they feel, um, a lot of the communities um, may entertain respite stays of no more than a month. And then the residential care homes are usually, um, you know, a minimum of two or three weeks and um, maybe even month to month from that point forward. So, um, you know, we can definitely touch upon and explore those options based on your preferences. Again, looking at your uh, financial costs and again, how are we going to be paying for senior living and care? And that's something that I think I'll be touching upon here in a few other slides. So I think we can move on. Again, I think I've touched this uh, over and over, being proactive as opposed to reactive, right? So most people are reactive, unfortunately, as opposed to proactive. And when discussing and coordinating important financial decisions with family members, um, a few of them have had any discussions really about important financial topics with their spouse, uh, adult children or parents, and active discussions and coordination with family members can be different, be the difference between smooth sailing and significant hardships when confronting family challenges. Um, there is a troubling lack of discussion, again, as if not talking about it won't happen to us because it won't happen to us, right? Uh, and I'm... Um, I'm guilty of that. Um, I have yet to work on my advanced care directives. And I think there is no age um, you know, of diving into that and making your needs and wishes expressed not only verbally with loved ones, but in writing and consulting with an elder law attorney uh, about those matters and what matters to you most. Um, you know, there is a dangerous absence of planning and discussion and coordination and the establishment of safe boundaries as people navigate um, these family interdependencies. So this lack of proactive engagement and discussion can really negatively impact every aspect of your retirement. So very few people talk with close friends and family members, right? And, um, and I want to kind of bring about some statistics again, because I'm all about statistics, just to put things in perspective, this is a scary phenomenon. 70% uh, of those age 25 and over have not had an in-depth discussion with their parents about those uh, about these retirement issues. And more than half of those age 50 and over have not had such a discussions with their adult children. Uh, nearly one third age 50 and over have not even had such discussions with their spouse. And just one in four, about 24%, have discussed how their parents will be financially provided for or cared for as they age. So uh, there is a payoff of proactive planning and discussion, and there is a need for thoughtfulness and discussion about retirement as pre-retirees and retirees plan for how they're going to support their family as they move to and through retirement. So those who have had financial discussions with their spouses or adult children are, are almost twice as likely to say that would, they, will, they are well prepared. You want to feel more than content and happy if and when the time comes. It's not a matter of when practically, it's a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when, excuse me. So again, you want to anticipate needs, talk with your healthcare providers and have that open, transparent form of communication with those you care about. You don't want to be a burden on themselves, on them. You don't want to be a burden financially or physically or emotionally. And, and I'll be touching about, uh, upon caregiver burnout here in a, in a little bit. Um, but at the same time, the last point here is, is to really make the appropriate and timely senior living and care transitions. All too often, I work with family members that have been misguided or misled to senior living communities. Um, whether it's a, a pastor or somebody in their community or a friend's daughter has had their mom or loved one or spouse um, in a group home or a community and they just go by, oh, okay, well, that's a wonderful option. Let's explore it. And then they sign up, but you need to really compare and contrast because what may fit your needs may not align or with your principles and values. And again, every, every individual's circumstance is ultimately different uh, from spouse, from individual to individual, spouse to spouse and so, and so forth. 
I think I had already touched upon this. So, you know, you want to speak with your primary care physician, your case manager in the, in the hospital or a therapist to really work on a holistic plan of care for discharge or post-acute care needs. Or if you're still at home, hopefully safe, you want to work and express your, your goals and wishes. Um, and you want to understand what the cost implications will be uh, as you enter the community and if and when you are to need a little bit more hands on care leading until uh, leading up to end of life. Uh, one of the most important questions I get so how do I know that one of these places is the right place or how do I know how can I entrust you Denise as my patient advocate and senior living advisor, how am I able to entrust you in providing us with vetted, qualified options? Well, um, there it's a twofold and it's a very complex question, but to kind of give you, I guess, the, the tip of the iceberg is all of the uh, care communities and care providers that we work with are licensed by the Department of Health Services here in Arizona. Um, and we really do a, a great job of continuously screening and not just pre-screening and doing that initial uh, boots on the ground. And of course the cleanliness, the um, compatibility of our client with that environment has to be to align. Uh, we do continuous legwork. Uh, are they still in compliance? To what extent? And, and knowing the uh, individuals that work there, um, how long have the care staff uh, worked in that environment, right? The consistency in care. Um, really, our peace of mind is your peace of mind and your peace of mind is our peace of mind. So, you know, we are, we're a team. It, it takes a village to kind of, uh, you know, piece the puzzle, as I like to say. Um, and so I think the Department of Health Services does a good job of, you know, doing unannounced sur survey inspections. Uh, usually once a year, they knock on the door of each community, big and small, and they uh, may stay there for at least a few hours, three hours, or maybe a full day. And they go through all of the documents pertaining to the residents that um, have lived there or are currently living in that environment from medication records, medication administration, uh, everything is documented. Who has given what medication and what dosage at what time? bowel movements um, in terms of size, there are progress notes. If an individual has a do not resuscitate or do not intubate or any specific end of life wishes, um, those would be um, uh, depicted in that resident file. Uh, in the case of an emergency, medical personnel would be able to uh, follow those instructions accordingly. So um, really it's about the individual and it's about the person within the patient, something that I always emphasize. Um, I, I have a very um, a keen heart for individuals and organizations that um, don't perceive clients or a patient as a number on a, on a roster. It's more than that. It's not Bob Smith in room number 21, bed A or B, right? It is your mom, your dad, uh, grandma, your spouse, husband, wife, son, those are individuals that we care about. And I work and we work with individuals that truly care what, uh, about what they do. They don't just clock in and clock out. Um, they go above and beyond in terms of communicating with family members so that everybody feels at ease, whether you're there in person to visit your loved one or you're, you're, you're not, whether because you're sick or you're traveling or you're out of state, it's important to trust the process and to trust the staff because if you don't trust that environment it's all for nothing right and and the same goes with us when you um, have a conversation with a, a patient care advocate a senior living advisor it's important to be as transparent as possible you want to be fully transparent because only then they're able to provide you with all of the best options. You wanna be able to say, yes, my loved one gets up in the middle of the night. They have some wandering. Um, I've had clients you know, ending up uh, you know, walking the freeway, defecating in Costco. Uh, I've seen it all. I've had 
individuals that have driven their car in through the garage into the living room. I've worked with adult protective services. I've had to be escorted with um, uh, with police with the police department to a, a lady's home to extract, for lack of a better term, her from her home because of safety concerns. And as a medical professional myself, I have it's my duty to um, report elder abuse of any and every kind. So, you know, my, I wear many different hats in what I do. And uh, ultimately, you know, I work on our client's time frame. It's not my time and place to um, force anybody to make a decision, um, but it is my job to fully inform them about what their options are so that they can make an informed decision. And then how to pay for senior living and care. Right, so again, everyone has unique circumstances and uh, that helps you determine how you're able to best fund senior living, whether for yourself or for a loved one. So when reviewing finances, uh, it's important to determine how your income compares to the expected and anticipated cost of living and care. Uh, and if the income falls short of expenses, you may be able to make up the difference with help from a family or by tapping into savings and investments. And I know a lot of you may say, oh, but I don't want to tap into savings or my retirement, but really that's why it's there. You have earned that money to give back to yourself. This is the time to uh, invest back in yourself and to ensure your peace of mind, your quality of life, right? And uh, sometimes you're maybe, you may be able to, um, you know, sell, sell your home and, and include the value of your existing home into that, but your options don't end there. And today there is really a variety of financial options that are available through a number of different resources. And some of them are depicted here and uh, offer, you know, some of them offer more flexibility than others, uh, different accessibility to resources, why not? You may or you may not qualify for every option. And not every senior living community accepts or qualifies for government payments, such as Medicaid, for example. So in this case, this is the part where I would direct you to your financial advisor or elder law attorney. And why not working um, with a, a patient advocate to assist and guide you through this process simultaneously. Um, sometimes annuities and investments. So if you have a nest egg, but you're concerned about outliving your resources, an annuity might be a good option for you to consider, um, or private long-term care insurance policies. Um, I'm sure we're all made aware of those. Uh, one thing that, I, that came to my attention rather uh, relatively soon is funding long-term care services with a life insurance settlement. So while most purchase life insurance with their beneficiaries in mind, such as a life insurance policy can be applied toward living benefits if needed. So a life settlement or a life insurance uh, settlement, same thing, it converts an existing life insurance policy into money that can be used to pay for long-term care services. And this is where a third party purchases the policy for a cash payment. And that is typically anywhere from about 50 to about 75% of its face value. And uh, after purchasing the policy, the monthly premiums become the responsibility of the third party company. And so that company receives the full, um, full value of the policy after the original policy, pol uh, policy holder dies. That's one way uh, that you uh, could be able to fund your senior living and care. Another way is a bridge loan to help pay for senior, for senior living and care um, or a reverse mortgage. Uh, of course, one of the more untapped uh, unknown uh, options are the veterans aid and attendance pension benefits. Uh, so that those are some government options there. And it really offers funds to some eligible wartime veterans and their surviving spouses who have low income and limited assets. Um, and so with this, you have to qualify financially and medically. And I think as of 2021, an eligible veteran may receive up to 1,900 and some odd dollars a month and a surviving spouse with no dependents is eligible for up to 1,200 and some odd dollars a month. Um, and of course, if, if you or your loved one is a veteran with a non-veteran spouse, they would be eligible for up to 2,295-ish dollars a month through the um, aid and attendance pension program. So you'll need to go through the Veterans Administration if you want to 
and go about the application process yourself. Uh, however, I, I must warn you, it can be very time consuming and um, uh, very complicated. So in this case, you know, working with a veterans aid uh, and attendance pension claims agent would be my uh, advice to you as they are able to cross your T's, dot your I's and um, help simplify the process of qualifying. Uh, and of course, um, one of the last uh, government options would be the Medicaid, uh, Arizona Long-Term Care System Program, Altex. And one of the more, most um, uh, common questions I get is, does Medicare help pay for senior living and care? And let me answer that for you. So Medicare is the federal health insurance program for people 65 and over. And some of them um, that are younger than that age with certain disabilities um, may be able to qualify. So just like any other health insurance program and plan, Medicare does not cover long-term care services. Therefore, Medicare does not pay for the cost of room and board or personal custodial care in an assisted living facility or long-term care environment. So there's a lot of uh, confusion between Medicare and Medicaid. Now, Medicaid is a joint federal and state program, and this helps people with low income and limited assets cover health care costs including long-term care. But with this, you have to qualify financially and medically. So it is a twofold uh, process. And it is important to note that Medicaid has a look back period of uh, 60 months, I believe. So five years in which all past assets are reviewed to ensure nothing was sold for less than it was worth or given away for that matter. Um, so there is, a, you know, it is a, a twofold process. Um, uh, they do have a uh, financial criteria of, I believe, if you're a single applicant, you have to have no more than 2,383 in gross monthly pay. And if you are a married, um, uh, if you're applying as a married couple, uh, the both spouses have to apply uh, with an income no greater than 4,764. So again, each spouse can have up to 2,382. Again, I cannot emphasize the importance of talking with an elder law attorney and a financial advisor on this. It can be very gruesome, very complex. It's not my specialty by any means, but uh, I can certainly point you in the right direction when it comes to that. And of course, last but not least, pooling family resources. Um, so if you're worried about mom or dad living alone or other family members, um, you know, getting everybody together to talk about it sometimes makes it possible to find a solution. Uh, and this is where you would pool assets and even trade money, uh, for example. Um, so I've had instances where family members, whether one or two siblings or family members handle the majority of daily care, uh, whether it's driving to medical appointments and of course, everything that comes with the, 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 with the aspect of being a caregiver and the ones with the less flexible work schedules might contribute money instead. So if there is a family home that no one wants to sell yet, siblings um, you know, with available funds might pay for assisted living with the promise of repayment when the house is sold. So that's also an option as well. Denisa, we're gonna have to start wrapping it up here because we're gonna lose everybody. Okay. Our, our meeting is gonna end at promptly at 3.30. So I was wondering if you'd like to uh, take some questions from yeah. our, our guests and see if there's anything, uh, any loose ends out there that uh, folks would like to ask. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like. I think, Nola, you had a question earlier we couldn't get to. You're She's still... already answered it. It was one that was dealing with the, um, um, not this how to pay for it, but one of the other slides. And she already answered it. Okay, fantastic. All right, is there any other questions? I know I think we got I touched upon caregiver burnout here. Uh, I love that quote. Caregivers are often the casualties, the hidden victims, and no one sees the sacrifices they make. So again, you have to have a plan. And you have to have a plan A, plan B, and plan C, and potentially plan D. Why not? So uh, again, uh, you know, one of the statistics is one in four caregivers spends about 41 hours a week providing care. Uh, that's a full-time job. Let's see. 
one thing I hear a lot of my clients say rather often as a common denominator is I wish I would have done this sooner. And this can mean a, a, a number of different things from starting the conversation to asking questions, just dabbling into the researching options and uh, all the way to exploring viable and potential solutions. And of course, even settling uh, on a decision, whether A, accepting in-home care services or acknowledging help. Uh, assistance and support, um, and B, having in-home care services, or C, transitioning into a senior living community altogether. These are some uh, resources and helpful links that I've included on here, um, but I can definitely send you a list of some other very pertinent um, websites that I think are wonderful and they provide an extensive list of you know questions to ponder upon and to consider um, for end of life for assisted living and planning um, for the future. And this is my contact information. You have my office and cell phone. You can visit us on Yelp or Facebook and Google to see what other clients have to say about our services. Um, I've been in this industry, like I said, um, for quite some time, and um, I, I, you know, I feel it's a continuous learning curve for for me as well. Uh, there is no um, uh, cookie cutter solution for anybody, and it really just depends on so many different uh, factors and elements. But um, if I can provide you with any further details or really help steer you in the right direction, how to start the conversation with a loved one. Um, you know, how to pay for senior living and care, you name it, anything senior um, related, I'd be more happy to answer that. You can call me or text me, email, whichever is convenient for you. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Denisa. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I just, before we leave, I just want to let you know, and I think it was Nola earlier had mentioned, will we have have uh, accessibility to this presentation as well as the uh, PowerPoint. Um, as soon as I get those downloaded, I will put those up on YouTube, our YouTube channel. Just look for Benavia in the YouTube channel. And it's on our playlist, which is called Educational Workshops. And I will also send each and every one of you a link to that. So you'll have all our information. Plus, we'll post it out on social media, our Facebook page, and our website and all that. So. Um, it, it will be readily accessible. Just so you know, our next um, presentation will be Wednesday, April 14th. And we're going to talk on something that's very uh, appropriate to our discussion today is stress management. I mean, it, <laughs> the future is very stressful. So we will be touching on that as well. So um, I, I will leave it open, the floor open here. We have a couple of questions still. Uh, but I, I can just tell you the Zoom meeting is going to end by itself, um, usually at 3.30, so we'll see what happens here. But um, we have some questions in chat. I will go over those and email you back uh, directly on those, asking for a, a good name of an elder care attorney. Denisa, do you have any recommendations on that? Yes, Laura Johnson. It just Laura depends Johnson. on that. Uh, it just depends on what part of town you live in. Laura Johnson, Stephanie Bivens. Um, um, yes. Uh, again, the list goes on. So let me know. It depends on you know what your um, driving ability is as well. So we really consider many different things. I just wanted to say, Denisa, thank you. Oh, you've welcome. you've given me some refresher information that I had forgotten about, and some new information. So now I've got a lot of thinking to do. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at your disposal if you need any other questions answered, uh, whether in the near or distant future. Um, think of me as your community resource. And um, again, there is no silly question. Uh, I wish I would have had a little bit more time. And, and I know Jay was worried that I uh, would, you know, fly through this presentation, but um, I, I'm very passionate about, about what I do. And uh, this is something that is, again, it just grows on me by the day. Well, I got to go. It's 331 and I've got something handing on at quarter to four. So I got to go. Thanks, Denisa. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, you know Jay, what? and we'll see you again. I promise. We'll have more information about Denisa and her company as well in that email. So you'll have all the appropriate links. If you need anything and you forget where to go, just call Benavia and I will get that information out to you and I'll put you in touch with Denisa as well. 
All right. Okay. Folks, have Thanks. a wonderful afternoon. Be healthy. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.